latest in ship propellers is ready for United States Navy tests. Invented by Professor Kirsten of Washington University, the device propels and steers a ship in an entirely new manner. By changing the pitch of the blades, the line of thrust and hence the direction is changed. No rudder is needed on this Navy landing craft. The new propeller goes through practical tests which may usher in a new era in maritime engineering. Vessels equipped with the revolutionary new propeller change course easily, making for both safety and speed of maneuver. The ship can stop in its own length. The ship can turn in an amazingly short distance, an invention which will contribute much to peacetime merchant shipping. International Tribunal holding court in the former war ministry in Tokyo come the wartime leaders of Japan to be indicted as criminals. Chief of them is Hideki Tojo, facing trial in the same building where he once held power as war minister and premier. The 27 defendants enter the prisoner's dock. Judges enter, representing nine allied nations. The man who engineered the Mukden incident in 1931, Shumei Okawa, prays conspicuously as the reading of the formal indictment by United States Captain Ben Mehta begins. Then Okawa weeps. Again, he scribbles away, apparently taking notes, but later on seems to relax completely in shirt sleeves and bare feet. Finally, the strangest incident, he slaps former Premier Tojo. The court orders Okawa removed for psychiatric examination. The proceedings continue. All the defendants plead not guilty. Their guilt or innocence will be determined under the law. Thousands of tons of water per second pour over the Grand Coulee Dam in the state of Washington. During the winter, the mountain snows were unusually heavy, and now the flood over the dam is in record volume. A great flock of 3,000 sheep are on their way to cross the Columbia River to better summer grazing lands. Pastures are dry and sparse on this side, so they cross the dam, on top of which is a roadway. Recently sheared, this flock will be pasture fattened to provide meat to help in the world food shortage. Commissioner Paul McNutt, General Manuel Rojas, President-elect of the Philippines, arrives for a visit with President Truman. On July 4th of this year, the Philippines Commonwealth will attain its independence. General Rojas speaks to the people of the United States. The Filipinos are grateful and have a deep affection for America. Although the color of our skin is brown, the temper of our minds and our beliefs is almost identical with yours. The Philippines, in government system and tradition is a replica in miniature of the United States. There has been transplanted to a land 10,000 miles across the seas, the seed of American democracy. 
if a prosperous and free democracy can be built in the Philippines upon the ruins of war, the prestige of America and the American way of life will be raised to towering heights and the millions of people of the Far East will look to us and to you as their models. In a blinding Arctic blizzard, the snowmobiles of Operation Muskox near the end of their 3,500 mile journey up across the Arctic Circle to the top of the North American continent. Three months were required to complete the trip. The caravan was supplied en route by airplanes. Eskimos and Indians are the only people to be seen. Along a route traveled by few visitors, they are delighted to see the party of 50 Canadian, English, and American scientists who brought back invaluable data on Arctic meteorology. Also, the procession of 10 vehicles across the frozen wasteland proved the feasibility of moving military forces over such terrain. All 10 snowmobiles stood up under extreme conditions and finished the three-month trip on schedule. As the caravan moves past mountains of ice and snow, a herd of caribou is startled by the visitors. Near the journey's end, heavy planks help the vehicles through the spring breakup. Information obtained by this expedition opens the way for full exploration of northern Canada. In New York Harbor, food for the hungry is loaded aboard ship. Each 30-pound package contains essential foods and is a voluntary contribution. In Washington, President Truman personally buys 100 packages and urges all Americans to contribute. The Cooperative for American Remittances to Europe, C-A-R-E, will supplement UNRWA and act as a means for the whole country to, divide, to provide a hungry person in Europe with food enough for three or four weeks. I commend it to the people of the United States. Later, the President and Secretary of Agriculture Anderson are host to Mr. and Mrs. Canada of the great farm state of Nebraska. The Canadays, successful American farmers, have made large contributions of food and money to go for the relief of the world's hungry. Such generosity merits reward. So when Mrs. Canada admires the White House roses, the President snips off a blossom and presents it to her. The unselfishness of this Midwestern farm couple is an example entire nations might well copy. Western American wheat pours into trucks in America's effort to contribute bread for the hungry abroad. The schedule calls for 50,000 carloads of American grain a day, and the Northern Wheat Belt is rushing truckloads of wheat to the railroads. In Canada, an escort aircraft carrier that served in the war is loaded with wheat for the hungry. At the request of UNRWA, Canada is shipping 275,000 tons of grain. After having campaigned against U-boats in the Battle of the Atlantic, warships are now on an errand of mercy.